Hello and good evening, everyone. I'm Mrs. Malini Kulshresht from Monfort School, Roorkee, and I take delight and pride in the school that I represent in initiating this webinar as a moderator today. It's heartening to inform that Monfort Roorkee has organized this webinar for the staff of all schools run by the Society of Monfort Brothers of St. Gabriel and the schools that come under the hubs of learning, Roorkee. The topic of the webinar, as already communicated to you, is on the footsteps of Gaia nurturing nature. I'm more than pleased to say that this webinar is a part of the Montfortian Action Plan for Total Sustainability, abbreviated MATS, which has been inspired by the concepts of integral ecology and ecological conversion. Before we move ahead with the webinar, I would like to give a few instructions for the audience. The questions from the attendees can be typed in the chat box, which will be taken up later. At the end of the session, you will be sent a Google form link, which you are supposed to fill in and submit. It is only after the submission of the form will the certificates be issued to you. And the certificates will be issued only to those participants who have actually registered themselves and were present for the seminar. I feel fortunate and blessed to be a part of Monfort School Roorkee, which is committed and feels responsible to undertake and pursue the drive that has been introduced by the congregation Monfort Brothers of St. Gabriel. The mission of this webinar will certainly not end with the closing of the seminar, but it has been taken up assertively to be the voice of tomorrow. Humans are the intelligent elite among animal life on Earth. And whatever be our mistakes, Earth needs us. It has taken almost 2.5 billion years to evolve an animal that can think and communicate its thoughts. If we become extinct, Earth has little chances of evolving another. Save Earth, cry of the Earth, and heal the Earth are a few resonating popular phrases that have set the alarm bells ringing. We are all aware of the burning issue of conserving and nurturing nature. Human interaction with the environment is something that has brought so many adverse effects in some areas, for example, overpopulation, pollution, deforestation, etc. While there are positive sides to it too, for instance, urban green projects, ecotourism, waste reuse and recycling, etc., etc. Development is imperative, but as we try to hit these developmental goals, it is important to think of the impact of such developments on what surrounds us. If such developments are not sustainable, then it means that we will definitely come to suffer at one point or the other. The recent pandemic has taught us many lessons. The 21st century choice says, look after the planet and it will look after you, or don't and face the consequences. The question now is, our ancestors did great work for humanity. What are we going to do for our next generations? We have not yet learned that the laws that work for nature work in human life and societies too. That what we sow, we must reap. Need I say here that a frog will definitely not drink up the pond in which he lives? We need to understand that nature is not inferior to be exploited or an enemy to be destroyed, but an ally to be respected and replenished. We are part of the web of life and many strands 
have been broken. There is a great need for the introduction of a new value in our society, where bigger is better. I'm sorry, where bigger is not necessarily better, where slower can be faster and where less can be more. I think I've spoken enough already. I now take this opportunity to express my heartfelt gratitude and appreciation to Reverend Brother John Kalarakal, Superior General, Monfort Brothers of St. Gabriel, Reverend Brother Pratap Reddy, the Assistant General and in charge for the province of Delhi, Reverend Brother James TK, Assistant General and in charge of Peace and Justice Commission, and all the distinguished counselors for the endeavors in conceiving the Montfortian Action Plan for Total Sustainability and being the driving force behind the noble cause of furthering this concept of nurturing nature and encouraging the member schools to actively and consciously plan their agenda to strengthen the cause. We are thankful to them for their spirited guidance. I extend a cordial welcome to Reverend Brother James Ekka, the Provincial Superior, Province of Delhi, and National Chairman of India for gracing the event today. I humbly extend a very warm welcome to all the reputed provincials of the different provinces in India, esteemed superiors, deserving principals, from Monfort schools across India and from other schools under the hub of learning Rurki. Respected brothers and formators, members of the staff from all schools in India, managed by Monfort brothers of St. Gabriel and the staff fraternity from the hub of learning Rurki. To all those who have joined us from across the country, I'm sure it's going to be indeed a rewarding experience. It's now time to introduce and welcome Dr. V. Padma, the resource person for the webinar. Dr. Padma is a retired professor English from Stella Maris College, Chennai. I wholeheartedly welcome you, ma'am, and we're looking forward to the expatiate on nurturing nature from you. Thank you for honoring us with this opportunity by your benign presence, ma'am. We welcome you. I heartily welcome the flag bearer for Maths, Monfort School, Rurki, Reverend Brother Albert Abraham, the principal of Monfort School, Rurki, who volunteered to be the initiatory for the purpose. His conscious efforts to channelize properly the intent of this webinar and to preside over it is indeed admirable. His invaluable guidance and assistance in ideating the proposition of today's seminar to bring committed people together, to be able to provide a platform to actually benefit maximum attendees so that we all can contribute to making a planet sustainable is much fulfilling. I extend a warm and gracious welcome to you, brother. May I now re request our respected principal, Brother Albert Abraham, to address the assemblage. Good afternoon to all of you. Reverend Brother John Kalarikil, Superior General, Montfort Brothers of St. Gabriel. Dr. V. Patma, the speaker of the day. Reverend Brother Pradab Reddy, Assistant General and in charge of the province of Delhi. Reverend Brother TK James, in charge of Peace and Justice Commission. Reverend Brother James Saka, Provincial Superior, Province of Delhi and the National Chairman. Provincials from all the Indian provinces, especially Brother Irudayam, the Provincial of Trichy, who has registered and he has joined with us. Local superiors, principals, brothers, sisters, headmistresses, coordinators, and members of the staff from Montfort School across the country, and the well-wishers of Montfort institutions. 
Today, as one Montfortian family, we all have come together to attend this webinar and benefit from it. Before I proceed further, I inform you about the untimely death of Brother George Joseph, local superior and principal of St. Alphonsus High School, Nalgonda, Telangana. He died on 11th of September due to cardiac arrest. He was a member of the province of Pune. Let us all pause for a moment and pray for the departed soul. On behalf of all of you present in this webinar, I express the condolence to the staff and management of St. Alphonsus High School, members of the province of Pune, and the bereaved family members of Brother George Joseph. May his soul rest in peace. I welcome you all to this webinar organized to remind us all and take a great message to many that it is high time that we do an introspection on the importance of nurturing the nature. These days, when people speak about protecting the environment, the main point they stress upon is the fear that the future generation may be deprived of certain natural resources if they are not used judiciously today. But I believe the thought of nurturing the nature should not be the result of our fear that our future generation would be deprived of certain facilities we enjoy today. Rather, it should be the result of the innate love we have for the nature and the care for other organisms on this earth. If nurturing the nature is a result of a fear, this nurturing won't be a sustainable one. So it is very important that every step we take to protect our Mother Earth is a result of our love and responsibility for it. Our Mother Earth is a mother of every organism on the Earth. Every organism on the Earth has equal right on its resources. When we respect the right of every being on this earth, we can't become exploiters. We are not to be the exploiters of nature, but the caretakers. The natural resources are to be used, not misused. The creative use of natural resources in the earth can make the harmonious coexistence of the beings more beautiful. And the goal of every integrated human being in this regard should be that. Following the footsteps of His Holiness, Pope Francis, Montfort brothers across the world take different initiatives to promote the love for the nature. The focus of our initiatives is to inculcate love for the nature among the people. This webinar on nurturing the nature an attempt with the same goal. Today, we have an eminent personality, Dr. V. Patma, an academician, theater personality, and a social activist who has been dynamically engaged in the promotion of ecology since many years. As a person who is very much concerned about environmental matters, she would be enlightening us today on several environmental issues. I welcome her and wish her all the best as she is going to touch many areas of utmost concern in her talk. If we observe the life of the people who genuinely live an eco-friendly life, we can see lots of values in their life. 
the values which are required to establish a happy and prosperous life in this world. So, with no doubt, we can say that to become eco-friendly means to be purified. Dear all, let us attend this webinar carefully and get some points for our analysis and make our life eco-friendly. Thank you. Thank you, brother, for such insightful keynotes to the chapter. Reverend Brother James Ecker, the Provincial Superior, Province of Delhi, and National Chairman, is an eminent personality in the province. His altruistic and selfless contributions to the society are creditable. A very down-to-earth, simple, and approachable person, he is much loved by one and all. I invite Reverend Brother James Ecker to say a few words. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, brother, you are. Very good. God looked at everything he had made. And behold, he found it very good. This is an extract from the Holy Bible. Respected Dr. V. Padma, the resource person of the day, Brother Albert Abraham, the principal Montfort School Rurki, brothers and headmistress, headmasters and headmistresses of Montfort School, India, local superiors, brothers, collaborating sisters and teachers. Good afternoon to one and all. I believe a very good tone is, has been set to take off. And I am here to express few or share few words, few thoughts on the topic. We would be hearing much, yet I have to say this. Today we are connected with one another through this webinar to reflect and reaffirm our moral responsibilities to nurture and protect our Mother Earth, which is our shared home. Our fragility as human beings and our interdependence on one another, as has been eloquently exposed by the pandemic, is more than enough reason for us to be united and committed not just to ward off the coronavirus, but also to work together for the betterment of humanity. Concern for the environment has now become a major preoccupation. Nature provides us all with so many wonderful and useful things. The beautiful sights, snow-capped mountains, rivers and streams, green forests, living beings in the water, land and sky, food and shelter, all are gifts of nature to us. Mother Nature, works very hard to ensure that life can exist and coexist in the driest deserts and the lustiest rainforests. As industry advances and the human footprint spreads, the delicacy of this balance increases more and more. As a result, it is ever important that we do our due diligence in helping nature to thrive however we can. And this starts with taking care of the environment. Humans, though often unintentionally, have the most detrimental impact on the environment. However, 
there are multitudes of ways in which we help the environment as well. That is to say, our impact on the environment can be positive or negative. Our way of life currently dictates that some pollution is going to occur regardless of what we do in our everyday lives. Life is chemistry and chemical reactions are happening everywhere that helps us to accomplish amazing feats and are essential to the more hassle-free times we live in today. Currently, efforts are underway all over the world to develop newer and cleaner energy resources to power our homes, run our cars, and light up the night. The combined efforts have been showing progress in many different ways. We can help by getting involved and conservation, conservation and, work, and voluntary and staying in contact with our local environment programs. A clean environment is vital to not only to our own healthy lives, but survival of all living things. The air we breathe is the most essential resource that the environment provides for us. And our efforts to reduce air pollution are currently not even facing the pollution being pumped into the air daily, especially in major cities. But air pollu pollution is not the only type of pollution we should be concerned with. Water pollution, and land pollution are equally devastating and, to sh and it should be a matter of great concern for us all. When we think of the environment as something that may actually be hurting us if we do not take care of it, the need for a resolution becomes much clearer. Therefore, I need, we need to take care of mother nature. Mother Earth or Mother Nature, whatever you may call it, is our home and the place where we live today. All the times we see, such as the trees, water, the grounds where we toil and walk around is part of our Earth. We have experienced the love and care of, of our mothers. They cared and nurtured us as we grew, fed and kept us safe. For all the good things that our mothers did for us, what have we done in return? Of course, I'm sure we all have most likely done all we could to reciprocate their love and care that they gave us all these years and continue to do so. So also our dear mother nature has blessed us and has made the world inhabitable for whom we, from whom we get food to eat, water to drink and irrigate our land, clothes to wear and keep our body warm and a place to rest our weary soul. What have you done in return for all the good things Mother Nature has blessed us with? Well, for most of us, we have done absolutely nothing. We keep taking from her to the extent of destroying and disfiguring her beautiful face. We have felt and seen the wrath of Mother Nature through the myth through the number of freak storms occurring, the challenge of weather, the heat of the sun that burns our skin, and air we breathe is no longer acceptable to human health. All these are signs of what our future and the future of our kids will be. 
if we continue to ignore the crying of mother earth the cry of mother earth as she cries for help i wish to conclude here by inviting you all that we can all do something no matter how small our act can be in fact all good things start with small and our small action may not be appreciable right now but we rest assured that it will certainly make a difference and just like the fact that it will make a difference to our environment if only we use things or products that will not harm the choice is ours but it is expedient that we care for the earth we live in thank you thank you very much thank you so much brother for such stimulating words you have actually set the pace of this webinar in motion i must say by bringing out such thought provoking uh, facts before us and we are looking forward for the next chapter by our resource person thank you brother may i now seek the presence of mrs sindhu ramesh my colleague and co-host for the webinar to formally introduce and welcome the resource person thank you so much malini ma'am once again a very good evening to one and all who have joined us for the webinar today i consider this my proud privilege to welcome our resource person dr v padma who is a retired professor in english from stella marys college chennai also known by her pseudonym a mangai dr padma is an eminent and well established personality in indian theater today and is actively engaged as an actor director and playwright in tamil theater for over 3 decades her fields of interest are theater gender and translation studies wherein she has been teaching performance studies in various colleges and universities across india she has also authored a book titled acting up on gender and theater in india 1979 onwards which was published by leftward new delhi a recipient of fulbright fellowship twice at new york university and university of california dr padma has also successfully conducted a course called drama from the other worlds in king alfred's college winchester for two consecutive years she has also been awarded the rockefeller bellagio residency for four weeks to work on her monogram on gender and theater in india passionate about community theater dr padma has directed over 35 plays through which she advocates courageously for women's empowerment and gender equality an avid reader and an environment enthusiast dr padma firmly believes in the therapeutic value of nature which she claims renders a sense of calm connection and belonging having stated all this it is indeed an honor and privilege to have you on board ma'am we are sure that we will leave this session as more enlightened individuals with this i hand over the forum to you ma'am thank you thank you sindhu good evening to one and all i i just can't believe that this is an honor that i'm experiencing right now and talking to so many of you who are teaching across the board in so many different schools from all over the country but what i think makes me happy is that uh, i am here because i am a proud and happy teacher and uh, i thank sister sandra mary who really connected me to all of you and to this universe of shared spirits and i think that is how universe functions you know it's just a speck of dust and then the connection really becomes bigger so thank you all i know how meticulously the planning has been done and all the arrangements have been done 
and uh, to get me to learn technology is the most difficult thing. And I think your team has worked with me really, really patiently. Uh, so I'm going to be sharing um, the slides with you. I've, I've just divided it into two major parts. And I really want you to take it as an open conversation. You know, it's a kind of an open thinking. So the first part is going to be about various philosophical traditions, which actually say the same thing. You know, but they are called in different names. They have been created across uh, centuries. But then this has been the guiding principle for uh, our life in the universe and the universe in this cosmic uh, presence. And the second half is going to be more of our dire situation now. And what we as teachers, as people who are in touch with the students, uh, ac across ages and all over different landscape can actually plan. You know, I'm I'm not a specialist and I don't think I can provide you a blueprint, but I hope I can actually kind of uh, flag off the main things that we need to take care of while we are planning our activities uh, for the years to come. You know, as the brothers said, this is just a start of a whole new thinking, whole new process, whole new way of working. And I hope it achieves that. Uh, let's go to the PowerPoint. So I've called it on the footsteps of Gaia. And um, I mean, today the term Gaia has actually become uh, part of either the, whether you do deep ecology, or environmental studies, you touch on the aspect of Gaia. And I think it is more of a tradition because Gaia is a, is a goddess, um, the earth goddess from the Greek tradition. Next slide. So what Gaia really tells us is that the earth is an organism. I know there will be many, many science teachers here, so I can't really compete with, or you have the birds visiting you and there are just droppings of animals or birds and you leave it without cleaning it. The next day you will find some new life there. So you, if you if you have potted plants, so it re, you clearly know that what you think is a showcasing of potted plants actually has life simmering with it. So an organism is a living entity. And what happens is this organism is not operating independently on its own, though there is an autonomous way in which it functions, but it connects with the inorganic material, whether it be um, just the sand, uh, all the other things, the kind of material that you use, the kind of buildings that you provide, the way it faces the sun. So it really connects to the various inorganic material dynamically to shape our biosphere. I'm sure all of you are quite familiar with Attenborough's BBC documentary, which has clearly documented to us how what you see as a mountain once upon a time would have been a wooded forest. And what you see as a wooded forest today probably was an ocean. So we, I mean, you are, you are living uh, at least Uttarakhand and other places or living close to the Himalayan region where people are really talking about the changes that are happening. And same here, I'm speaking from Tamil Nadu. We are uh, at the cusp of the three seas. And, you know, so, uh, but then we know how the sea is changing over the years. So it is a dynamic biosphere change that actually comes up. And Gaia hypothesis is asking us or demanding us to be attentive to that. Next slide. Now what I'm going to draw on what in Tamil is called Thinai. And we translate it as eco space, which is somewhat equivalent to what people call as biomes. Because if you read environmental science, they divide the whole world. You know, remember, this is not just nation bound. This is not even continent bound. 
It is the whole, the series of all the continents around us, the whole earth into biomes, beginning from Iceland to the ocean down. So there are various biomes and the, in the middle is the equatorial biome to which we all belong to, which is temperate. And I mean, when I say we, it is anywhere from Italy, Italy, the Mediterranean to whatever we are having till Africa. That whole space, if you remember the world map, all of which will come under um, under the system where we can claim that we have temperate uh, uh, climatic, climatic conditions. Now, Tine is not even talking about everything. Tine is talking about the just the corner of India where you have the Tamil speaking region, which will consist of Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, and Kerala together. And I'm sure there are people from, oh, from those origins. Now, what Tine actually says is that there are the whole idea of categorically analyzing life rests on landscape. So your life has to be analyzed, not on the basis of uh, what you are, where am I, who am I, all those individual things come later. But it comes from what is your soil? What is your landscape? You know, and that landscape inevitably decides your mindscape the way you look at it. I mean, you just have to compare why is Rajasthan a land of desert having so many colorful fabrics? Why is Kerala so green and lush having this pastel white as their usual color? You know, I mean, it, it's, it's just interesting to see how the landscape builds a certain mindscape in all of us. And if you really delve deep, you can find your own reasons for why you like this color. You know, yesterday when I sent the PowerPoint immediately, Sister Sandana Mary said, can I make it colorful, ma'am? And then I told her, yeah, make it colorful, but not too decorative. And look at the color she has used. She has used the soil. She has used green. She has used the ocean color. You know, uh, I, I don't know whether she thought about it. You may come to it in terms of beauty, but then remember color schemes in your psychology are unconsciously built. And where does that unconsciousness come from the landscapes that you are used to? And that's going to stay with you. So that landscape essentially decides your mindscape. I'm not going to go deeper into Tinais because we have a whole gamut of classical Tamil literature which belong to this tradition. And um, where we have divided the landscape into five major landscapes. Kurinji refers to the mountains. Mullai will be the slope of the mountains. And Marudam will be the riverine belt where all civilizations grow and Nadal will be seashore. Now, what is Pali, which is some people translate it as desert. I would prefer to translate it as arid land because I believe that you can reforest the desert. Because Pali simply means when Kurunji and Mulle, the mountain and the shrub forest near the mountain lose their characteristics, it becomes arid it becomes pollen. So it is something that is caused either, either by itself or what we call as man-made. For once, I like the word man-made in that, you know, but otherwise it's all human being. We know everyone makes it, but since men are in the decision-making powers in most places, I think it is man-made. And all these warning bells began in the 1970s for us. And this five thinnies, have to be further categorized into the different matters that we have. And what are the matters? We have what you call as primary, mudal, which is just the flora and the fauna of a landscape. Even in Tamil Nadu, we have a classical text where there are 99 flowers mentioned, and the botanists are still finding some of the flowers. And this was present some 20, three centuries ago. 
this song was this classical text was written some 20 century 20 odd centuries ago and we have, we have lost the flora and fauna so we don't even have the name of the flower now but then some of those names are found in kerala in the neighboring state so it it is you one needs to really find out what is our landscape made up of what kind of trees can go here? What kind of trees will coexist in this place? Not just eucalyptus all the way. Because eucalyptus is going to just draw the water out of the earth. We are not eucalyptian. Australia is eucalyptian. You know, so therefore we need to come, go with the land in order to reforest. And then within each landscape, apart from the primary matter, we also have what we call as karu. Karu is a beautiful word in Tamil, which means fetus, which means something that is in an embryonic state. And what are they? They are the people who live there. So if it is a forest and there are hunting tribes, or if there is a mullay land, shrub forest, and they are all shepherds in that land, then all those people form the karu. They are the embryo of the land. You know, so it's the other way around. It's not Anthropocene. So you don't start from asking that I what am I in this? You know, you are just part of that landscape. Among the flora fauna, you're just a simple dot. And then you have various work that you do, whether it is hunting, food gathering, pottery, metallic works, whatever work that you do. And then based on the different ways of living of the community, there are different worship patterns that has evolved there. So what we are talking about is not religion, but we are talking about practices of faith that are there right from the tribal uh, belt among the women in specific, because each community has very, very female specific uh, rituals and uh, all the things that they really believe in. I mean, I think all across India, at least, we know that if there is a marriage that is happening, you do grow plants some one month ago. And the plants are there in these pots and you go and dip them in water. And the, it goes across various levels of communities. You have it in various forms. You know, so there are ways in which the faith system make people connect themselves to the work and to each other. Now, when they live together, what happens is it gives room for what we call as Wuripurul, which is the emotion. So there is this major emotion that is assigned to each landscape. So the Kurinji, the mount, uh, mountain region, is supposed to be very romantic which is probably why right from Bollywood to Holy Gollywood to uh, whatever, Tollywood, the moment you have a duet song, you go off to some mountainous region and there is dancing and everything. So that is union. That is That refers to union, couldn't you? Mulle refers to the part where there is a separation in order to produce some wealth, in order to earn livelihood. So the, probably the man goes off. If you look at the shepherds, the shepherds go with their cattle, go a full circle, actually producing fodder to the earth and come back. And by the time they come back, that, that particular patch of land is ready for the next harvest. You know, so talk to any community of farmers, they will tell you all these practices. And then you have Marudam, where of course, since we have got surplus, Man is a greedy human being. So the moment you have sur surplus, you really are talking about uh, saving, you're talking about controlling, you want to possess it. So even the idea of marriage as monogamous is anthropologically must have begun from the riverine belts. I'm not going to go into it. That will be gender. But I'm willing to take questions after that. Nadal will be the seashore where the relationship is not really working out. There is a separation. So the woman is wailing. I mean, she's separated and uh, she's sad. And then in Pali, that suffering gets consolidated. So overall, 
I don't know why 23 centuries ago, this community of Tamils who divided this landscape and gave us this philosophy of eco space, it thought that this will be sad. But this whole Uri connects itself to the what we call as Agam, the interior life of the people, the personal life of the people. But there is a Pura. There is an exterior part of life where there is, you know, how do you win the land? How do you fight with each other or live with each other? All those things will come under Puram. So this is roughly, I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to really connect Tine to Gaia, which must have come around the same time. Because Greek civilization is also dated to about 25 centuries. I'm not talking more on this, but there is a need to really talk about this perspective and philosophy in order to shape our discussions today. The next slide. Is something that I don't have to explain. All of you really know. I mean, what is really, really interesting? I know I know I have worked in Stella Maris College. Uh, the patron saint is um, Francis of Assisi. And like St. Francis, St. Montfort is also one of a path, path breaking missionary who really brought in the worship of Mary, the worship of uh, Rosary. I'm sure all of you know that. And his French connection also gives. And now you have all his poems compiled. In fact, we have one of our students, Sister Alfonsa, who has done her whole PhD thesis on Catholic eco mysticism. And Montford is one of the poets she had chosen for analysis. And I love these lines that Montford says. The eloquent silence of rocks and forests. Only preach peace. Breathe only innocence. So what we are really talking about is, yes, is it beautiful? Yes. But what is it actually creating in you? You know, the, when we talk about ecotourism, we are talking about happiness as something exciting. But I think the real happiness is when you're at peace. When you can be silent, when you know that everything around is fresh and which is what I think St. Montford actually captures for us. So I think with St. Montford, there is an important need to connect it to eco spirituality and eco mysticism. For those of you who want to refer to his poem, it's 621 in his collection, which is what I think Pope Francis is insisting now and is making it into a big mov movement called Praise Be to You. Um, now, this whole idea of eco spirituality, of course, began with what we name or what the church calls encyclical, which is integral ecology which believes that people and the planet are one. There is no question of for the people, for nature. You know, I mean, you don't have to pity nature. You don't have to be an advocate of nature. Nature knows to take care of itself and you because you're part of nature. People and planet are one. Now, this whole thought of encyclical comes from St. Francis of Assisi way back in 13th century. The Canticle where, as all of you know, sun, moon, water, fire, earth, everything is treated as our kin. In fact, uh, the only question that I have as a literature student in that is a definite gender is assigned to sun, moon, water, earth, etc. right from 1986 with Joe, uh, Pope John Paul II, uh, followed by Pope Benedict. Today, the church is celebrating 27th uh, October as a day which celebrates the spirit of St. Francis of Assisi, which I think should become the core principle of ecological thought. So this is roughly, so I'm drawing something from Greek, I'm drawing something from um, Tamil, I'm drawing something from Christianity and the institution of Catholicism that is spread all over the world. Now, I'm going to shift to a contemporary discussions. And I'm choosing to use Jane Gleason White, who is an Australian poet, 
and an accountant. Let me put it that way. So the full title of Six Capital, uh, the book is that can accountants save the earth? Now there is a whole connection to ecofeminist thought in Jane Gleason White. Um, but then I'm going to just stick to the six cap, the idea of the six capitals, which he brought in in 2014. So as a thinker who thought about economics, also a poet who is thinking about the broader humanity, what she identified are six capitals. So she says for us, the accountants, people who are accounting, we count financial and manufactured capital or the, as the two capitals that we can identify and talk about. Now, what she says is that there are other categories of wealth. What you and I will call as raw material or resources, she calls it as wealth. And what are the wealths that she is talking about? She's talking about intellectual wealth, the kind of knowledge systems that people have and the kind of human wealth that we have, which is the answer to the population theorists who really think that population is meant to be a liability. But population can also be an asset if we really kind of treat them as capital. So there are skills, there are productivity, there is the health of the humans which really come. And I think we all realized the wealth of the human during the lockdown so much more than ever before because we knew what it is to have a human contact. I mean, even now we are only meeting virtually. You know, the, sen the five senses that we use and we have as human beings, which, are, which we are holding back today because of the lockdown. So it is an imperative, it is imperative today to recognize human as capital. It is a human capital. And of course, we have the social and relationship uh, capital, which comes from shared norms and values. And then you have the natural capital, which includes the whole of Earth. Now, she writes it in 2014. And in 2019, she, because she is an accountant as well, she attends a corporate conference in New York. And then there are many companies which are talking about so many different things. And she finds the word blue gold being dropped. I really want you to think what is blue gold in the corporate sense. If anyone wants to answer or put it on a chat, you may. It's like a quiz. Yes, any guesses? for blue gold, it's not black gold, which is the coal. It is not liquid gold, like diesel and petroleum. It is blue gold. Blue, yes. I refer to may I, ma'am? Yes. Is it water, ma'am? Thank you. Thank water. you so much. I know many of you would have had the answers. The technology had, it is water. And she gets totally upset because she thinks that here I am trying to make people change the idea of capital and really treat it as part of the organism. And then to, to, to treat water, which is a life sustaining molecule in financial terms as blue gold, and then I think I don't think I have to tell you who is harvesting the blue gold in India today. We all know that. Yeah, so we all know that our earth, whether it is a Coca-Cola Coca plant in Pilachimedu in Kerala or any other water plants are now becoming a corporate sector. So she goes back and then in July she wrote an article in The Guardian where she actually said, OK, I think I used the wrong language. I used the patriarchal language because patriarchal language can only think of property and profit. And she said, I'll go back. I'll go back to my ancient mother's language and really describe water 
as something which is a living molecule of life sustaining power. And she she writes this on July 31st and I have a quote. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, it's a bit thickly textual. And she writes it in The Guardian. And she says, in my vision, economic students sit outside barefoot on the ground whose touch and smell tell them that this very earth is water is the matter at hand. They listen. They listen to the wisdom of their elders, First Nations women first, welcoming them to country, this land, telling their stories and sharing their wisdom. They learn that economics is the art of managing and caring for the earth, this planetary household, and therefore for ourselves, all of us equally, and that the economics is the sacred social space organized around relationships of care. So she's literally turning the field of economics and raising other questions, which usually the economists don't really raise for us. You know, and that that, of course, stems from ecofeminist thought, which we will come to later. So Jane Gleason White, who is a poet and an economist and an accountant, who is really asking us to think differently, I think provides us a way to connect us to the first part that we were really talking about. I just want to kind of, I'm, I'm focusing on Uttarakhand, which is a really, really, um, it is it is sitting on fire, as we say, you know, because it is one of the most beautiful, most resourceful state in the country, which also has amazing nature population. Almost 70% of Uttarakhand is supposed to be, the 73% of Indian forests is there in Uttarakhand. And there are so many different tribal communities who are part of that land. So you have national parks, you have wildlife sanctuaries, you have conservation reserves, you have biosphere reserves, all of which really are the rich tapestry of that state. Let's see what are the issues that we have. Next slide. Yeah. So what is really happening is, you know, we don't associate Himalayan spring to dry up at all. But then today we know one fourth of the Himalayan springs are drying up, which is what is giving room to the glaciers and therefore the sudden floods. So I don't think people in that area would have forgotten the 2013 floods. I don't think villages have recovered from that. There are so many number of numbers of people whom we lost during that. So there is also the climate change which we are facing. Bo, I mean, people in Delhi, for example, face the worst summer and the worst winter. You know, and um, of course, in uh, Kerala and Tamil Nadu, our monsoons are shifting. Touchwood, we still have some idea of the cycle of seasons. Hope we won't lose it. And you have forest fires, you have landslides, and you have uh, a very, very strong pilgrim tourism and wildlife tourism in a state which is very, very tiny and which is very brittle. So how are we going to kind of balance these and safeguard? You know, this is a photograph that my son, who is an actually an eco journalist, an independent eco journalist based out of Bangalore, and he visited um, Uttarakhand in 2013 and went back to it in 2014. When he went in 2013, nobody expected the floods. And we were all completely worried and everything, lost all connection. And I mean, I just love this way in which you know how in front of that nature, you look like a pygmy. You know, you really look such a small, tiny figure when you are next to that mountain and the flowing river in that area. Next slide. Which I picked up from online because uh, River Rispana is something that you find in the regional uh, poetry, the description. You know, there are so many people who talk about it and sing about it. So on my on 
the screen, your left is Rispana then some, I think sometime in the early 20th century. And then you have now, actually if you Google and you go through the Google map, you get the landscape that was there. You just go back on Google map, you will see how much of uh, 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 loss that we have actually incurred in all that. I know all of us are technically savvy now and we keep looking at those things, but you just have to do this and put them all together in one canvas. You know how much we are really losing. Next slide. I'm, I, I just want to connect the first section and the very, very sketchy uh, idea about one state and what is happening there to uh, what can be done. You know, so all of us are concerned, we share the same spirit, but then I think I, I, I put it into three A's and I really think it begins with awareness. The awareness of what, how much of electricity do we use? How much of bottled water do we use? How much of plastic waste we produce? At every moment, if we can really be extremely attentive and mindful of our way of life in every single thing and do your carbon indexing, which we can all do individually now, you know, we are never going to say enough on our own unless you actually recent study on how the economists are looking at environment. I like the word accounting and I'm not using the word accounting from accountancy. I'm using the word accounting from its word responsibility. Are you able to account for? What are you accounting for? So if I'm going to count, uh, if I'm aware of what is given to me at some point, I need to account for what have I done with it? And all of us have grown with parables. You know, the father gives so many um, the cattle and then the children get it. What do each son do with that cattle? Becomes a story. So we need to be really accounting for whatever we receive and not take it for granted. No, without taking for granted, okay, there is water, okay, there is air, you know, but then if we can account for it and not really, you know, pollute the air, for example, with the number of vehicles that we use. Even if we can just carpool, you know, that's a small gesture. If we can take a public transport, that would be wonderful. So whatever it is, I think that becomes important. And there are people who have done it. I mean, I would really urge you to look at Vangari Mathai's memoir that she has written, the only woman who received the Nobel Peace Prize, the Kenyan uh, activist and author and an academician who did nothing but brought the community to reforest its own land. That's it. There are films, there are documentary films on Vangari Matai which are beautiful to look at where the community members come and plant. In fact, in our college, we used to do that. Every child, every student who leaves the, um, the institution as a, as a team, as a class, they plant trees. And I know of students who come back after five years to check if their tree has grown. You know, of course, the campus is not big enough. We are in Chennai. We don't have that big a campus. So sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But the little greenery, I mean, you can Google on Google map, go in, go and look for Stella Maris College. I mean, we are not totally happy because we are, Every time a new building comes up, that's a big debate among us, among the faculty members and the parents and the students. But then you try to make sure that when you are cutting a tree, plant seedlings, saplings instead, which is what the tribal community does. The tribal community is not just cutting down trees unconsciously. They do it knowing which tree to cut. You and I who are new to the forest, we don't know. So you just cut, you know, without any sense of understanding of what needs to be done. Now, all these three aspects of awareness, action and accounting 
needs to be applied at different levels. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've just classified it into terms that we will all understand. So I'm just imagining it to be a horizontal and a vertical classification where we keep the awareness, action, and at, uh, uh, accounting. And then within that, you divide it into individual, institutional, community, governance, and media, and be able to come up with something that will tie everything. Now, that is important because we cannot just do, okay, as an individual, I'm doing everything that, that needs to be done, and that is enough. I mean, given a chance, I can lead a life like that. Because I know I'm not abusing nature. But I don't know if I'm contributing to nature. You know, so I don't know. I could stop there. But as a person who has a profession of teaching and you're meeting young minds, what are you going to do as an individual? And I, I mean, I, when um, I had a chance to really discuss with Malini, um at length actually we ended up having a long conversation and i was telling her there are ways in which teachers at the elementary school can just you you and i may not know if i come to whichever state you are in i may not know the name of a fruit or a flower that is specific to your landscape so you as a teacher who may be working in another landscape Tell the children to teach you. It is nice. Because when you make the students your teachers, they do best job. They do the best. They come up with things that you and I have not noticed at all. So it can be just identifying the plans, identifying the names, identifying the stories around those trees, identifying grandma stories and grandpa stories about animals that were there. What are the endangered animals there? You know, so as an individual, and that can be connected to the institution. I'm sure all of you are familiar with um, the UNESCO, which has announced Gurukula Botanical Sanctuary in Kerala as a heritage. Now, what do they do? They actually kind of have this model and they identify, so they have regular educational visits of the children who come and visit there. And it's not about just coming in the morning and going in the afternoon and bringing your sandwich and having your, I know children love to do that. But if you can choose among them, and if there are people who are willing to stay, let's say for a week in that park, let them do it and they will know. They will know what it is to live with less. And they're only living with less and they are not poor because they are getting the best air, they're getting the best water, they are probably getting the best of fruits and vegetables. You know, so the, that institution in the Western Guard, Gurukula Botanical Sanctuary, you can Google them. They are very, very, very active online and they have actually made the students part of reforesting the rainforest. So there are various schools with which they work continuously. So it is not about one project and finishing it for your annual report. It is something that needs to become a way of life and part of the school program calendar. It's there in our calendar. We do it automatically. We don't need to really organize it every day. So, and they also do it along with communities. So there are communities which are given charge of noting the animals, of noting. I don't know how many of you saw, I forget the name, where uh, it's a Hindi film about Tiger Sanctuary. My favorite actress, what, I can't get her. It's a Bollywood film. It'll come. Anyone? Yeah? yeah Chenni. It's a beautiful film. And who are the protagonists of that film? The community people. Because they help the officer save the cubs. Against all bureaucracy, against all the troubles that she has, and against all the gangism. And I'm so glad that the, pro that the lead actor did not 
um, she did not grab the attention. She accepted that she doesn't know and learned from the community. So which is what Gurukula is also doing. So involve the communities that are going to be part of that. I have used the word civil society because then you can actually kind of bring in the rural, urban, semi-rural, semi-urban complex, uh, you know, those continuums can also be built in. I'm not going to talk much about governance because I don't think that is in our hands, but all of us know that our work should speak to the powers that be. That's it. I mean, in Shakespeare, we have a play called Tempest. And there is Caliban who lives in the forest and this Prospero goes and to the land and he actually starts living there for a long time. We read it as the story of Prospero. But then Caliban, who is a native of that island, he curses and he says, you taught me language and I know how to curse. you." So I think the only way to speak to powers is to do the work that we keep doing so that the governance or the policy makers have no other go but to look at you. Yeah, that's one way of looking at it. But you can actually look at ways in which economic, social, justice and environmental uh, balance can be achieved. And one of the institutes that uh, that does it with just local population who are the organizers and there are volunteers, so anybody can volunteer. You can just go as a guest and volunteer there in Himachal Pradesh, Sambhavna Institute. And all that they say as their vision is to develop value-based leadership. And the leadership that is not assigning work, but that is doing work along with everyone. So there are different models of leadership. So this is a participatory leadership where they are able to develop that. And media, of course, plays an amazing, amazing role in that. And I would include media of all categories, whether whatever be the language. And to me, media can will include the nursery school paintings on the wall. What do we really draw? What is the backdrop? I mean, I saw the backdrop that you have for this seminar, you know, which is so beautiful, which really talks about children's work, children's art, and brings in the combination of a flower and plant, of a plant life and the birds. So how do we really look at those things? And I think anything that we do as part of curriculum or co-curriculum or extracurriculum should come under the way we define media today, because media is not just big media houses today. You have your own YouTube, you have your own uh, recordings that can be done and all our work can become part of the media. So with that, I just want to leave you with one question, which all the speakers, all the people, next slide, the last, have uh, raised these questions. You know, so if, if you're going to say that you have received the earth, you're here, then what are you going to leave for the future generation? And as father, brother said, um, I don't think this question needs to come from fear. This has to come from, of course, our love of nature, but also something that we are bequeathing our children to do, the love of nature. So the ethics of care and sustenance is actually teaching ourselves and the people around us and the next generation to love, guard, nurture, and actually raise, raise that uh, awareness that all of us are interconnected. And I just want to end with the song, the speech that was rendered by one of the Native American uh, leaders, chieftains, called Chief Seattle, and which is a classic literary text, and it is an ecological text. The, in literature, we have a lot of debates about who wrote it, what was the talk, was it recorded well, somebody else rewrote it after so many years. So we don't know whether it is right or wrong, but whatever we have now, 
ascribed to Chief Seattle gives you this philosophy in a nutshell. And this has come from the land of the America, which is calling itself as the most developed of our countries of the world and has uh, and is also consuming close to 60 percent of our natural resources. So we are. Um, it is from that land you have the voice of one of the first Indian people's leader who gives that and this is set to music. And I really wish that this song will become the anthem for all of us. And we are only sharing just a three minute clip of that song. And with that, I would take questions and will be happy to receive your comments. Thank you so much. Let's play the video. did this the entire video i think the crux of what you the essence of what you wanted to convey was beautifully put in that in the lyrics of the song and i think it has shaken me completely now to speak much 
every part of me as of now i feel is exactly as has been told in that song thank you for rousing that conscience in us once more and giving a broader perspective of the topic ma'am it's time now for the much awaited question answer session to begin which dr padma is waiting anxiously to answer and take up the questions and the queries from our attendees i would like to first of all just inform once more to the audience that we will be taking up the questions from the chat box a little later uh, i request those who are there live who, whoever we are able to see live i request only those attendees to unmute themselves whose names are being called out and they can ask a question to dr padma this is an earnest request because there'll be a clash of the sound and the technical difficulties we might come across so it's just a request uh i'm able to see you from here and i would like to just call out your names please unmute yourself and we'll try to take the maximum queries as far as possible and try to give everyone a chance mrs dipali bhatia yes can can we see mrs dipali bhatia there yes mrs dipali bhatia can we have a question from you please can you unmute yourself yeah i have unmuted yes. am i audible ma'am yes ma'am okay good evening ma'am i must say uh, this is a wonderful webinar and, and uh, something uh, which i feel uh, of course i must uh, admit that this is the first time i'm attending this kind of uh, uh, webinar on guy a new concept yes of course uh, and uh, much can be done ma'am i want to pose two questions to you ma'am uh, the first thing is uh, what kind of curricular changes what kind of changes can be brought about in the curriculum so that uh, the concept of nurturing the nature can be started from right from uh, the kg or maybe the prep stage i mean i this is not an advice but i think uh, you can come up with your own ideas but i would really say um anything from um listening to the stories within the landscape that the children come from would be a starting point which can be something that they will submit in some form or the other so there are many countries which have introduced um i mean now they are doing photography earlier it used to be just painting you know i mean ch children are asked to paint uh, uh just observe and come and paint three things that you find uh in your house you know or uh, near your house or whatever or the story so it i think it can begin from there in the kindergarten uh, school you know i mean and it may not be and being extremely conscious about the background they come from about the kind of households that they have and whatever language that is spoken in the household so i think it it is even it doesn't have to be a separate subject that that would be my idea because i always feel that once you make it a subject it becomes um something that you leave to them to handle you know so a science teacher will handle or somebody else will do environmental science so it is left to them but i think it is a consciousness that should come in all the subjects for example if we are teaching wordsworth's poem let's say in seventh standard or something and you are doing solitary reaper and that has clear echoes to the kind of poem that i read of monfort so it is things like that it is it is what the teachers can really prepare and uh, build in or weave into various subjects various papers that they are going to say that they are going to take it up i mean 
but this is just a practicing teacher's view. So I don't know the system under which you work, but I would say never burden yourself with too much work. Little work well done consistently is more than enough. Because the moment you start panicking about yeah. doing too much, then I think it becomes an issue. And lot of films. I mean, just start an environmental film club conducted by the students. They will get you materials, especially the high school kids. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. <laughs> I, I, can I put my second question? Yeah. I, <laughs> uh, we can also is, take uh, a few this questions. Is a lot of <laughs> yeah. yeah. If it's a connected question, Dipali, ma'am. I think you can. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, when we talk about development, ma'am, uh, the population is increasing. And we do find, find the uh, increasing uh, necessity to have more of buildings, infrastructure. We need residences, we need hospitals, so many things being taken place. And of course, we need land for that, which is limited. So how can a balance be struck between the two of them, uh, keeping in mind the need uh, for for ecological balance and sustainability. Yeah. One of the classic examples um, that India has provided for us from the state of Kerala is that without really pushing the family planning program down the throat of people, by educating the people, Kerala is one state which has 100% educate literacy. Every male and female members are literate. And the moment you are literate, then you are aware of, of course, the world around you, but about your own body and about the your own economic kind of conditions and what are the things that you, you have to really provide for, for the people, you know. So this whole debate between Adam Smith's way of looking at economics, beginning with population, and the way the eco-feminists have countered that is a whole new discipline that we have. But the only answer for it for us is the human capital is not just a liability. So whether we are bringing in mechanizations, I mean, we, we are supposed to have everything online now. And where is the infrastructure for online? Where is the economic capital for making the students have access to those online things, you know. So I don't think development can only happen in a very, very blinkered way. Development has to be taken into account the realities of the situation and social justice and economic justice being the core of the whole principle. So we cannot trample on the tribal wealth and the forest wealth of our country in order to build your multi-storied buildings. Because then you will have okay, Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Let's thank take you, the questions together if they are connected. So. Yes. My next, yes, yes, ma'am, surely. Uh, Mrs. Sangeeta Gupta. Oh. The next question from Mrs. Sangeeta Gupta. Good evening, ma'am. Am I audible? Yes. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate you and thank you for the wonderful session that we had today. Ma'am, uh, I am actually taking care of a lot of things. I'm teaching social science to the students. Uh, so many times I take care that among my students, I teach them. But what I find today, students are more uh, interested in gadgets and uh, they are more attracted towards the urban culture. Uh, even if we tell them that is something in the rural area, the beauties of nature, they are not wondered more about that. It's very uh, sad part that we are not able to shift the light towards that part of the children because they have been attracted towards that urbanization and more of developmental part. So sometimes I feel what type of uh, uh, 
teachings can be input among the students so that we can give them a background our basic whatever living style we should live exactly to get that base proper so my question to you was uh, can you help in this <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I think it is something about inculcating respect for labor. You know, I mean, I still remember. Um, I don't know if uh, so, so Sandana Mary's batch did that. I always tell my children, on uh, tell my students, not children, they'll kill me. Uh, so my my students, because they're all adult students. Um, whether it is on teacher's day or whatever day and they are producing something and I tell them do whatever you want without hall hallmark card cards. I don't want borrowed poetry. We are a literature department. You are poets. You are creative people. So give me anything and for that don't waste anything. So try and see if you can make any waste material into art. And give that a, 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 a kind of value that they would respect. I mean, I still remember when when we display it in our department walls, whatever the students have given us, and they're all made of waste products. They they just love it. Sometimes it is made of these Coca-Cola bottles and stuff that they have drunk in the college canteen, yes. you know. But then they you're growing a money plant out of it. So I think it is it is it is a shift in the attitude of uh, you know which will make them think next time and say I mean what is it that people respect people not all people respect only money and I think they need to get it in their heads that money is not the only wealth so therefore the other things that they bring maybe a song that they sing something you know and uh, the value that we assign from to that will certainly change the attitude of them but i don't blame the students at all for this consumerist culture because the whole of media is pro propagating that you know i mean children are children are wet soil so i i, I don't think we can begin anything by complaining about the generation I think it it comes from the fact that why this generation is behaving like this. What are the things that I had as a child with somebody this generation is missing? For all you know, some of the young parents here probably are actually playing to the tunes of the consumerist culture. You know, I mean, there are families which have two TV sets or something. I know all of us need two and three smartphones at home, you know, but because they say, oh, my children want to see that. I want to watch this. So let me beg and get two because you can afford it, you know, and look at the way the whole system, it is, it is cyclical. Yes. So, and it is a never ending process. So I think the inculcation of attitude, which respects labor, apart from the use of just your thumb, you know, I always say, what is labor for this generation? It's just your thumb and your finger because you type and you use your thumbs. Otherwise, you don't use any of your parts of the body, you know, which is why theater to me is very, very important because we train the bodies to work. You train the body to be aware of whatever the strength that the body can really give you and to be thankful for what we have got. Yes, yeah. ma definitely, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. We uh, try our level best with our children and we uh, experiment with them only. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I agree too here. Uh, as you said that uh, we are actually what we have got from our uh, previous generation. We need to carry, we carry things from our previous generation to this generation, what we see exactly. And it is our, it is the, the onus of giving things to the next generation definitely goes to us. So how we do that and in what capacity and in what smaller ways we are able to actually bring that into the lives of our children because the children of this generation, 
the Z generation, as we say now, they are actually born in this completely. What they see is with a gadget in hand. So the times are definitely changing. And yes, that yeah. adapted. Uh, adapt Malini, I would just put a caveat uh, yes. about uh, transferring whatever we received from the previous generation to that because not everything in the previous generation was good either. Definitely. Because not. they were very restrictive. They were, I mean, yes. we are still paying a heavy price right. for all the caste and religious bigotries that this country has, uh, yes. you know, developed. Uh, so we don't want to give room to that. So what we are yes. trying to say is, can we be mindful and create a critical awareness of what it is we want to treasure and what is it that we want to discount? Definitely, man. You know? Yes. Yeah. 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 We need to see that. Keep keep that in mind according to the times that are changing. Take the good and leave the bad. Yes. I would say yes. Yeah. Thank you, man. My Thank next. Invitee here, I would like to call upon Shalini Sharma, Mrs. Shalini Sharma. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Karma, ma'am. Thank you for yes. this welcome session. Ma'am, uh, I must confess that this is the first time I've heard of Gaia, the pre goddess of Earth. And uh, you said that the Earth is an organism, according to it. Is it a philosophy or do they have scientific proof? Because we have studied about Charles Darwin, his theory of natural selection and uh, origin of species. Are they related? No. See, Gaia actually comes from the Greek mythology. So if you really Google uh, Gaia and the stories associated with Gaia, you might be startled uh, because, you know, she is the one who produces uh ocean the sun the earth everything and you know so basically it is a greek mythology which personified her as someone who who will keep rejuvenating lives and gaia also and then people have built a philosophy around it including all the later developments that you are talking about all the studies in sciences that have come about in um zoology, biology, which have really given us this idea of, uh, I mean, Darwin, uh, Darwin's theory, for example, broke a lot of new grounds. So I think that the, that kind of study, it, it, the Gaia does, didn't really belong to that. Gaia is an old mythology, which the environmental science people, the ecology people made it into a philosophy. So they're just drawing from that, just like how I drew from Tine. But in my case, Tine doesn't have a story. There is no embodiment. But Gaia, if you, there are so many images of Gaia now. So if you go to European, uh, Greek and Roman um, uh, museums, they, they have so many, like in a vase, the Mesopotamian culture had a vase in which they have a Gaia holding the earth. You know, so that, that is one of the oldest one. And there are many people who are creating it now, right from uh, that film, film on ecology, showing these tribal people. Oh God, I'm blanking out on all films today. <laughs> uh, you know, they'll be blue in color, and this other community goes and in. It's a, Is it Avatar? Yes, Is it in Avatar, 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 for example. Yeah. So it, it is something similar. So Avatar, if you remember, they are talking about a female headed community. So Gaia actually kind of projects that. So Gaia for at least from where I my entry point is has been gender because I really think over the course of time, the patriarchal culture has created this diametrically opposite genders. So there is there seems to be a way in which the female uh, functions and the way the male species of the human beings function, you know. So I think it is important to really take the cue from the feminine, from the female nurturing aspects without glorifying it. Because if you're going to say, if you go to Hindu mythology, for example, which is why I didn't use it, uh, it says Bhuma Devi and she stands for patience. Yeah. 
-hmm. So even the greatest, uh, the heroine of Ramayana, uh, who is the daughter of Mother Earth, when she couldn't take this life anymore, she just reaches out to her mother and the earth just takes her in, which is what Hindu mythology says. Now, I am not talking about earth as a patient mother who will just, who on whom you can dump anything. I don't think mothers can be taken for granted either. <laughs> yeah, no mother. No mother, because mothers know their way. And they're not all lovey-dovey all the time. We are not. I'm not. You know, I don't think I'm a loving, I mean, I'm a loving mother, but I, I'm not lovey-dovey. So I don't really do that. So you kind of, the motherhood means being accountable to the next, what, whoever I'm bringing up. So I don't want my son to grow into a wife-beating man. I don't want my daughter to be this crybaby daughter who will take everything lying low and get beaten up by somebody, you know. So I am a mother who can get angry, who can be strict, who can be very understanding, and I will be there and just there. I think it sounds very prosaic, but uh, I think Gaia is about just being there. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Can I put another question? Yeah. In your last slide, ma'am, you left us with a question. What shall we leave behind for our future generations? Ma'am, we would like to listen to your answer. <laughs> That's just a rhetorical question. That's a rhetorical question. And I think we all need to have our own legacies behind. You know, I mean, uh, Though I'm born into a Hindu family, I don't believe in rebirth. So I just think that in this life, whatever little that you have got, you need to really leave behind so that whoever is taking it from you can proceed. And I think for teachers, we are doubly blessed. Because apart from your own biological, whatever, whatever, even if you're doing it, just for, uh, I mean, just and just as a word, I'll remove that word. Even if you are doing it as a career, it is your profession. And we are professionally blessed because we have the minds and the hearts of these young next generation people. You know, I mean, which is, I, I, I think I get my energy from the students. And which is why it is, Never easy to say no to a student. And that is a lifelong bond. You know, it doesn't matter that I have retired. It doesn't matter that my student has moved on in life, you know, but it matters that our connection is real. So in that sense, I think teaching is a vocation which gives you this blessed blessing that you have all these clays that you can mold into whatever you want. And I'm sure you will do it. And it's not easy. And it's not fast work. It is very, very slow. It's very slow. It does require a lot of planning and action and patience and everything. And it, uh, it doesn't, does, I think it only requires empathy. Empathy and compassion. That's it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I think we'll take two more questions, Malni, and then wrap it up. Yes, ma'am. This is what I just wanted to find out from you. Two more questions. So I would like to call on Mrs. Neelam Sharma now. Uh, a very warm good evening, ma'am. I really feel blessed to get an opportunity to attend a very enriching experience, ma'am. Thank you so much for that. Ma'am, uh, during your uh, explanation about levels at work, um, you told individual, inti uh, institutional, civil society, governance and media. Ma'am, I would like to just know or, uh, from you that how can we include or inspire or motivate the people from civil society? We as teachers, we'll definitely be with the institution. So how can we collaborate with these people, civil society, our school is situated in the outskirts of the city? and there are villages nearby. 
So how can we, ma'am, include them also in this mission? I think for, for educational institutions, our entry into civil society would be parents. Would be the parents of the children who come to us. And I think uh, that can be an entry point and the students themselves can become the ambassadors of environmental awareness if you're planning programs related to it in terms of art, in terms of uh, poetry, theater, you know, whatever you have. And I think it's a big thing when a child tells the village elders, let us do this. You know, so it, 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 they take them more seriously, probably, you know, than whatever the government announcements and posters are saying. So I think uh, the children can become the ambassadors of these <coughs> awareness to the civil society. So that would be one of the pipelines that I think we could actually think of. There are many people like the one Gurukula that I told you in Kerala, they have also connected it to the market. So there is a tribal community and they have uh, actually enhanced their skills of, you know, whether it is basket weaving, mat weaving and the rest form themselves into cooperatives and they have expanded it to the markets as well. You know, so we are supporting the environment by actually kind of helping them, helping them by buying handicrafts. You know, in the textile industry, I think uh, there are many all over the country, right? From uh, all states have those textile cooperators, but we don't have as many for other handicrafts. Like Northeastern states, for example, part of their main tourism thing is these things. But there are fewer community members who are really taking it up. So in, in, in Tamil Nadu, for example, we, we wanted that to be included in our art and craft institutes. And so why should art be only on canvas? Why can't we build that as part of your syllabus? So things like that. Thank you. Thank you. Can I request all the attendees to just mute themselves? We are having a little bit of uh, the noise disturbance coming up here. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my last question, ma'am, as told by you, I would like to request Ms. Garima now. Ms. Garima. Uh, to... Good evening, all of you. Good evening, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate you for the webinar. It was really very interesting. Uh, Ma'am, being a science teacher, I'm very concerned about the environment. So what the, uh, the first problem which I found is the plastic pollution. Plastic pollution is one of the biggest problems nowadays. So how students can uh, incorporate the plastic solution on an individual level? What we can do in the school so that the, we can reduce the plastic pollution? I think different um, states have come up with many measures. There are many states which have just banned plastic bags. You know, especially the use and throw plastic bags is out. So we are going to replace it with material which are biodegradable. So that will be the primary thing. And all the plastic waste that especially the younger generation uh, generate with uh, water bottles, uh, you know, for example, why carry that kind of plastic water bottle, use and throw plastic bottle, get any water bottle, which is either metal or something that you can use again, or just have a pitcher. I mean, we have a nice spot with some tumblers so that they can just have it from there. You know, not you don't even need the big electrical thing to provide water for the school. You know, I mean, it looks very hep. But I think pot is enough. So I think the, that it, probably that is where the whole thing should start. But also remember, plastic is the cheapest material available for the kids. So at home, for example, if you tell them, don't use plastic water pots. If they are carrying lugging water from a long distance, 
Uh, I mean, I don't think that will be the problem in places where you have nice water facility, but in other places. So I, we cannot be judgmental like that. So we, we really need to find a way to not make them guilty, but just make them aware. So as much as possible, you know, don't without really pushing them too much. I think, but avoiding plastic bags is doable. Like masks now, you know, there are use and throw masks, but there are also cloth masks which you can uh, wash and reuse. Though there are people who say that that is not as uh, whatever durable or uh, as safe as the other um, hospital masks. But we are all trying out various things. So instead of just use and throw, which you find everywhere, all these green color masks, you know, if you if we go in for a cloth mask, for example, so it's something similar, something replaceable and reusable. Um, I mean, you know really well the importance of recycling, which which is what is going to be restoration. Yeah, you're muted. You're on mute. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, actually, I, I was going through, I was searching something to get rid of plastic waste, like uh, st uh, what students do, they eat uh, chips, they eat biscuits, and they throw the wrappers away. And those wrappers are not recyclable. So I just found out a solution to that, uh, that is eco brick. Uh, many of us must not be aware of that. Uh, what we do in the eco bricks, uh, we just take, we gather all the materials, all the wrappers that cannot be recycled at home or locally, and we pack them in a tight plastic, we pack them tightly in a plastic bottle. And then this eco brick can be used as uh, for the construction projects. Wow. We, we can construct something from this, like we can make buildings. Uh, I have seen a video also in that that girl was making a shelter for the street dogs. Wow. So we can encourage that also. Exactly. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, could this be the best solution to the plastic pollution, or do they more uh, do they possess more problems further down the line? Not really. I think that if once they become aware of that, then I think it will it will really take its own shape, right? So it should it should work in the long run. I feel. Except that our yes, ma'am, I really cities, found that interesting. But the big cities don't have facilities for dump yards. The, most of the big cities, and I think each of us is fighting. I mean, we are fighting right here where I live. Uh, a big swamp land is being uh, filled with garbage, with the city garbage, which is not even segregated. So, so it's a, it it is a ma major major. Uh, fight and especially if it is a mountain region and there is plastic around, then it's going to lie there for God knows how long. You know, so I think it needs to be done. And we haven't even, I saw another film from one of the Latin American countries where they use the human waste to produce manure. You know, so there are, there are these uh, city corporation which actually kind of collects them, purifies them treats them and then you get nice manure for your garden packed in that and it is all shit of various kinds i mean it sounds very awkward for you but that is a, that is one of the major scientific in inventions if we may say it and all the industrial waste and their treating mechanism in fact if they do that i think our rivers will be saved so i think we do need all of that we do need all of that. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you all the invitees here, those of you who have uh, taken the time and the effort to interact with Dr. Padma, keeping in mind the time constraint. I know we will not be able to take up more questions, but I and I also hope that these questions have been answered to your satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Listening to Dr. Padma has been a gripping hour and a half long session. And I personally feel, ma'am, it has been really, really, really very enriching. Thank you for such a lively interactive question hour session.
Once more to the audience, I would remind you for uh, taking, uh, trying to look at the, uh, keep in touch with the Google form that the link that will be sent to you and please fill in the form and submit it for the certificates to be issued to you. I would now Thank like you. to call upon Mrs. Anuja Chaturvedi to propose the vote of thanks. Thank you, Malini, ma'am. Good evening to all. It is indeed an honor to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks on this gracious occasion of the webinar themed on nurturing nature organized by our institution, Montfort School, Rurki. On behalf of my school and the entire management group here, I take this opportunity to extend my heartfelt gratitude to Reverend Brother John Calarical, Superior General, Montfort Brothers of St. Gabriel, Rome, for his invaluable guidance and spiritual support. I extend my sincerest gratitude to Reverend Brother Pratap Reddy, Assistant General in charge of the province of Delhi, Reverend Brother James T.K., Assistant General in Charge of the Peace and Justice Commission and the General Counsel, Montfort Brothers of St. Gabriel, Rome, for their indispensable shepherding and numinous backing. I express my deep sense of gratitude to Reverend Brother James Eka, Provincial Superior, Province of Delhi and National Chairman of Montfort Brothers of St. Gabriel's India for his unstinting support and guidance in all the endeavors of the school, including this day. I further express my heartfelt gratitude to all the provincial superiors of various provinces of India for having graced the event today. I earnestly thank all the local superiors, principals, brothers, staff fraternity from the schools managed by the Society of Montfort Brothers of St. Gabriel, India for participating in the event. I also thank the principals and staff members of our hubs of learning under the patronage of the lead collaborator, Montfort School Rurki, for participating in the event today. I, ex I especially extend my sincere thanks to our very dynamic resource person, Dr. V. Padma, for taking time out of her packed schedule to elucidate so painstakingly the need to nurture nature and thereby giving us some extremely valuable inputs and tips on ways and means to replenish the depleting natural resources for sustainable development. Furthermore, Dr. V. Padma has very explicitly responded to the questions and queries, I hope to the satisfaction of the participants. And I could see that all the participants were very satisfied. Ma'am, thank you so much and we cannot thank you enough for renewing our consciousness towards the topic at hand and i assure you that we as teachers will live up to your expectation of working hand in hand with students for the cause thank you so much ma'am above all i must take this opportunity to thank brother albert abraham the principal of the host school Montfort School Rudki for conceptualizing and initiating this event. He is a force to be reckoned with, possessing self-driven attitude, his active involvement in the activities pertaining to the ecological sustainability have been awe-inspiring amongst the parent and student communities 
apart from staff and well wishers and is worthy of emulation thank you brother i further thank the vice principal brother prashant kullu and the wellness in charge to the james casey for their moral support and kind cooperation i extend my special thanks to the headmistress sister santana mary who was instrumental in making the webinar possible i must mention this were it not for sister santana we would be deprived of this enriching session by dr v padma the resource person of today's webinar who was procured by sister i thank the coordinators mr deepu thomas mrs lizzy james and sister anthony xavier amali for their contribution constant support and cooperation during the entire process of planning and organizing the event i also thank the staff and members of the organizing committee of the host school montfort school rurki for organizing the events so meticulously now i must thank the very eloquent and articulate master of ceremonies of the function mrs malini kulshreesh i further thank the technical support team for the smooth functioning of the event and their contribution and last but not the least i acknowledge and thank all the brothers and well wishers for their encouragement motivation and prayerful support thank you all once again thank you thank you so well, much we've come to the close of the session being an amazing session thank you all for attending the seminar hope you've had an absorbing day and i would conclude with just one quote from tariq ramadan don't nurture a sense of guilt rather nurture a sense of responsibility married with a sense of humility thank you all thank you all for gracing the occasion thanks so much for this wonderful opportunity i'm sure it's going to be a new beginning definitely we have all joined hands here and it seems as if we have just sat across and talked to you ma'am <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you shall i take leave thank you ma'am thank you thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you ma'am so thank you brother albert thank you monford rurki for organizing such a beautiful webinar and successful one thanks a lot thank you brother